Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of American Civil War with your host, Bang and Dang. We got three Virginia battles for you guys today. You know what happens when we go to Virginia. That means probably Union is losing, which two of these three battles, the Union does lose. And Confederates are about to go on a little mini mini uh, winning streak here, all in the state of Virginia. We got the <laughs> Battle of Eltham's Landing, Who? Battle of McDowell, and the Battle of Drury's Bluff. Like I said, all in Virginia. First one's a Class D battle, then a Class C, then a Class B. And like I said, Confederates getting some wins here today. Some much-needed wins for them, I would say. I'm still <laughs> got to defend the uh, state of Virginia. Well, no, that's getting threatened at the time. What is it? We will have a uh, test of armory or test of defense around Richmond. The Union's going to uh, um, take up here, see how well Vir- Richland's protected so uh first up battle of eltham's landing better also known as the battle of barhamsville or west point took place may 7th 1862 in new kent county virginia as part of the peninsula campaign brigadier general william b franklin's union division landed at eltham's landing and was attacked by two brigades of brigadier general gw smith's command reacting to the threat of the confederate army's trains on the barhamsville road Trains on a plane. When Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston unexpectedly withdrew his forces from the Warwick Line, which we've covered, the Battle of Yorktown, the night of May 3rd, Union Major General George B. McClellan was taken by surprise and was unprepared to mount an immediate pursuit. Uh He wasn't unprepared. He was just too ignorant to do it. Let's put it that way. All right. 4th May, he ordered Cavalry Commander Brigadier General George Stoneman to pursue Johnston's rear guard and sent approximately half of his army of the Potomac along behind Stoneman. Under the command of Brigadier General Edwin V. Sumner. These troops fought in the inconclusive Battle of Williamsburg. Once we covered last episode. Which was on the 5th of May. After which the Confederates continued to move northwest in the direction of Richmond. Yeah, they're, they're falling back. Mm-hmm. McClellan also ordered Brigadier General William B. Franklin's division to board transport ships on the York River in an attempt to land and cut off Johnson's retreat. Oh. Took two days just to board the men and equipment onto the ships. So Franklin was of no assistance to the None. Williamsburg action. None. But McClellan had high hopes. Good idea. For, right. He had high hopes for his turn in movement, planning to send other divisions, which were those of Brigadier Generals Fitch John Porter, John Sedgwick, and Israel B. Richardson, All right. by river after Franklin's. Okay. Their destination was Eltham's Landing on the south bank of the Pamunkey River, across from West Point, a port on the York River which was the terminus of the Richmond and York River Railroad. Fantastic. From the landing, it was about five miles south to the small town of Barhamsville, where a key intersection on the road of New Kent Courthouse was being used by Johnson's Army on the afternoon of the 6th of May. Franklin's men came ashore in light pontoon boats. Hey, partying and everything. <laughs> right. Uh, and a 400-foot-long floating wharf was uh-huh. then built from pontoons, canal boats, and lumber. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so that artillery and supplies could be unloaded. Right. The work was continued by torchlight through the night. And the only enemy resistance was a few random shots fired by Confederate pickets on the bluff above the landing. And then at about 10 p.m. Uh, yeah, nighttime, but it's time to go down. And they were just firing shots just because... Uh-huh. Idiots. Johnson ordered Major General G.W. Smith to protect the road to Barhamsville, and Smith assigned the division of Brigadier General William H.C. Whiting and Hampton's Legion under Colonel Wade Hampton to the task. May 7th, Franklin posted Brigadier General John Newton's brigade in the woods on either side of the landing road, supported in the rear by portions of two more brigades, which were uh, Brigadier Generals Henry W. Slocum and Philip Kearney. Newton's skirmish line was pushed back as Brigadier General John Bell Hood... His Texas Brigade advanced with Hampton to his right. Mm. Hood was concerned about casualties from friendly fire and the thick woods, so he ordered his men to advance with unloaded rifles. Oh, yeah. He's like, he, hey, guys, I don't want you guys uh, firing on each other, but if you do get fired on, you're not going to be able to defend yourself. Because you know that's how the Souths were. The right. South, I mean, come on, guys. Come on. You guys know what you're going to do here shortly. Poor guy. <laughs> Encountering a Union picket line 15 paces away. Damn, that's not very far. Hood wrote... A corporal of the enemy drew down his musket upon me as I stood in front of my line. Fortunately for Hood, Private John Deal of the 4th Texas Infantry had disobeyed his orders and carried a loaded rifle. Yeah, good for you, John Deal. He managed to shoot the Union corporal before the latter could fire. As I, and you think he got punished? Why? Hmm. Disobeyed his life. Yeah, still. 
As a second brigade followed Hood on his left, the Union troops retreated from the woods to the plain before the landing, seeking cover from the fire of federal gunboats. Whiting employed artillery fire against the gunboats, but his guns had insufficient range. Yeah, of course they did. And so he disengaged around 2 p.m. Union troops moved back into the woods after the Confederates left, but made no further attempt to advance. Okay. The Battle of Eltham's Landing was little more than a heavy skirmish. Hmm. There, were, there was 194 Union casualties and 48 Confederate. Not all dead. Franklin told McClellan, I congratulate myself that we had maintained our position. I congratulate myself. <laughs> all right. Today, I'm very <laughs> proud of myself. <laughs> McClellan's like, oh, hey. Uh, all right. uh, although the action was tactically inconclusive, Franklin missed an opportunity to intercept a Confederate retreat from Williamsburg, allowing it to pass unmolested. Oh. Johnson was pleased with the outcome, considering the success his men enjoyed in executing the order to feel the enemy gently and fall back. Yeah, right. well, feel the enemy gently. He humorously asked General Hood, he said, what would your Texans have done, sir, if I had ordered them to charge and drive back the enemy? Hood replied, I suppose, General, they would have driven them into the river and tried to swim out and capture the gunboat. Hey. <laughs> You see what they done? One guy disobeyed my orders. Right. I can't believe it was only one guy. I'm like, screw you. <laughs> you ain't going in there with no one with no loaded weapons. You crazy? Moving on. Battle of McDowell. Also known as the Battle of Sitlington's Hill. I think uh the Battle of McDowell sounds better. Battle of McDowell was fought on the eighth of May, eighteen sixty two, near McDowell, Virginia. It's part of the Confederate Major General Stonewall Jackson's eighteen sixty two Shenandoah Valley campaign. Good for him. March eighteen sixty two, Union forces commanded by Major General Nathaniel P. Banks moved into the Shenandoah Valley with the goal of supporting Major General George B. McClellan's advance up the Virginia Peninsula. Confederate resistance to Banks' advance consisted of a small army commanded by Major General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson. Twenty first of March. The Union High Command ordered the majority of Banks' command out of the Shenandoah Valley, leaving only a division commanded by Brigadier General James Shields to deal with Jackson. He's like, Shields, you got it, bud. Yeah. Shields left his camp at Strasburg and began moving towards uh, Winchester north. Mm. March 23rd, Jackson caught up with Shields' division near Kernstown, which we covered. Mm. Faulty intelligence led uh, Jackson to believe that only a small portion of Shields' force was at Kernstown. Mm -mm. So he ordered an assault naturally. Mm -hmm. Instead, Shields was in the area with his entire force. Entire force. I mean, entire. Entire. And a sharp battle was opened. The Confederates took position behind a stone wall. Mm. Um, no pun intended. Right. I don't think it would be a pun since it actually happened. But right. after the Confederate uh, general... Brigadier General Richard B. Garnett's brigade retreated after running low on ammunition. The flank of the Confederate position was exposed, exposed. forcing Jackson to withdraw from the field. Yep. Despite having defeated Jackson at Kernstown, Union High Command was concerned by the aggressive behavior the Confederate Army had shown and began to send more troops to Shenandoah Valley area, including the two division of Banks' army that had been moved out earlier. Yeah, they seen that. They're like, okay, this guy's Stonewall. Like, well, maybe we shouldn't have moved our guys out. After the retreat from Kernstown... Jackson's force remained in the southern Shenandoah Valley. I would assume so. Waiting orders and preparing for battle. In April, Jackson received orders to keep the Union forces in the valley occupied with the goal of preventing them from joining with McClellan's army. <laughs> keep them occupied. Right. Just play with them a little bit. Which was near Richmond. Also coming to Jackson's camp, re reinforcements commanded by Major General Richard Ewell. Meanwhile, another Union force was moving against Jackson's army. Major General John C. Fremont's Mountain Department mm. was moving towards Jackson from the west. Across the a Allegheny? Allegheny. Allegheny Mountains. Fremont's advance force consisted of 35 hundo, and it was commanded by Brigadier General Robert Milroy. Oh, oh, Milroy. Milroy. Milroy reached the town of McDowell in early May. It was reinforced by another 2,500 men under Brigadier General Robert C. Schenck on May 8th. Jackson's columns departed their camps in the area of Westview and Staunton on the morning of May 7th. Jackson had been further reinforced by elements of Brigadier General Edward Allegheny Johnson's brigade. Right. The area around McDowell contained several points of high ground. A peak known as Jackson's Mountain was located west of the town. Okay. And Bull Pasture Mountain was east. Oh, fantastic. I don't know if it is, though. <laughs> well, a road known as the Parkersburg and Staunton Turnpike ran roughly east to west uh, through this very area. A hill known as Sitlington's Hill was located south of the road. Holes Hill was north. Who just goes around naming hills? Right. 
The Bull Pasture River ran between the town of McDowell and Sitlington's Hill. And Halls Hill. Holy shit, who cares? <laughs> Expecting an attack, the Union commanders sent out small forces to serve as skirmishers. Hey, man, who wants to be skirmishers today? A portion of an artillery battery was also sent to the southern portion of Halls Hill, where it kept up a regular fire despite not having a clear view of any Confederates. Hmm. Well, I guess. Union skirmishers from the 32nd Ohio, 73rd Ohio, and the 3rd West Virginia, all infantry, made contact with Confederate forces. Ooh, made Uh-oh. contact. Uh-oh. Schenck had overall command of the Union force, although he still retained nominal command of his brigade. Uh, Milroy's brigade contained six regiments of infantry, two artillery batteries, and a regiment of cavalry. <clears throat> nice. All the units in Milroy's brigade were from the states of Ohio and West Virginia. Right. Schenck's brigade consisted of three regiments of infantry, one battery of artillery, and a battalion of cavalry. Oh. Units from Ohio, West Virginia, and Connecticut were represented in Schenck's brigade. Fantastic. I'm all over the place. Some, huh? some Connecticut, huh? Yeah. I can see the Ohioans and West Virginians together, right. but on Connecticut boy in there? Hmm. <laughs> The Confederate Army consisted of three brigades, Jackson's original force and two brigades of Johnson's attached force. Jackson's original force contained a brigade of five regiments of infantry, two artillery batteries commanded by Brigadier General Charles C. Winder, a brigade of three infantry regiments and infantry battalion, two artillery batteries commanded by Colonel John A. Campbell, and a brigade of three infantry regiments and one artillery battery commanded by Brigadier General William B. Taliaferro. Johnson's force was composed of a brigade of three infantry regiments commanded by Colonel Zephaniah T. Connor. Dang. <laughs> and a second brigade of three infantry regiments commanded by Colonel William C. Scant. All of the units of the Confederate Army were from Virginia, except for the old Georgia regiment in Connor's brigade. Okay. <laughs> we got that out of the way. Uh, Jackson <laughs> then sent troops to take the lightly defended crest of Sitlington's Hill. Scott's brigade led the way. The 52nd Virginia Infantry aligned in skirmishing formation on the Confederate left. 44th Virginia Infantry and the 58th Virginia Infantry aligned between the 52nd Virginia and the road at the other end of Sitlington's Hill. Fantastic. 12th Georgia of Connor's Brigade supported the Virginians. Jackson and Johnson moved to the top of the hill to have a point from which they could observe the Union position with the hopes of finding a path suitable for a flanking attack. Dang, look at these guys. Milroy orders Union troops to attack the Confederate position at Sitlington's Hill disrupting the Confederate plans. The rough terrain had led Jackson to decide against supporting his line on Sittlington's Hill with artillery. He was like, oh, this is pretty rough for the artillery right. boys. Milroy and Shank decided to send five regiments against the Confederate line. The 25th Ohio, 75th Ohio from Milroy's aimed for where the Union commanders thought the center of the Confederate line was located. Well, the 82nd Ohio of Shank's brigade and the 32nd Ohio of Milroy's a line to the left of the 25th and 75th Ohio, and the 3rd West Virginia Infantry advanced along the road on the Union left. Okay. The fact that the Confederates held the high ground would prove to be a disadvantage for them. Mm. The sun was setting behind the Confederate line, silhouetting the soldiers against the sky. Oh, no. The hill also cast shadows that helped conceal the Union troops. 12th Georgia had been posted in an exposed position in front of the main Confederate line, made first contact with the Union assault. The Georgians' position and outdated muskets, as usual, gave them a decided disadvantage in the fighting. Further down the line, the 32nd and 82nd Ohio hit the main Confederate line, which had been reinforced by the 25th Virginia and the 31st Virginia of Connor's Brigade. The fighting became very, very heavy, with reports of describing the battle as fierce and sanguinary and very terrific. <laughs> All right. Terrific. At one point, Confederates fighting against the 82nd Ohio attempted to use the bodies of dead soldiers as breastworks. Why not? Right. The 5th Union Regiment in the charge, the 3rd West Virginia, encountered skirmishers from the 52nd and 31st Virginia, who were <laughs> guarding the Confederate right flank. Mm-hmm. The Confederates then received further reinforcements from Campbell's and Taliaferro's brigades. The 10th Virginia Infantry of Taliaferro's moved to the Confederate left, and Taliaferro's 23rd Virginia Infantry and 37th Virginia relieved the 25th in the main Confederate line. <laughs> They're like, 25th, you're relieved. They got the 25th. Uh, uh, <laughs> 25th, you get the 25th. Uh, towards the center of the Confederate line, the 12th Georgia, bloodied and out of ammunition, was forced to withdraw and was replaced by Campbell's 48th Virginia. Uh, Milroy shifted some of his regiments around, moving the 32nd Ohio to support the 75th, near where the Georgians had been driven off and bringing the 3rd West Virginia from the flank to the position formerly occupied by the 32nd Ohio. While the added weight of the 32nd Ohio forced the 48th Virginia to vacate its advanced position quickly, the outnumbered Union assailants broke off the assault. The fight had ended around 9 p.m. All right, just about dark. All right. Milroy and Shank ordered a general retreat the night after the battle. After burning supplies, they were unable to take on the retreat and disposing of extra ammo by dumping it into the Bow Pasture River. Mm. Jackson began to pursue 
of the Union Column on the May the ninth. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder. Has anybody dredged those rivers and looked for any of this like ammo and shit? Oh, I'm sure. Somebody went magneting, magnet right. fishing. Uh, Jackson. Jackson you think began. It would still be live. Mm, nah. Jackson began the pursuit of the Union Column on May 9th, and the Union troops reached Franklin, West Virginia, on the 11th of May. Jackson's pursuit reached as far as the vicinity of Franklin, but the Confederates broke off the retreat and fell back to McDowell on the 13th of May. Well, that was pointless. Right. Estimates of casualties vary between sources, as they usually do. One source places Confederate losses as 146 killed, 382 wounded, four captured for a total of 532. Dang. Same source gives Union losses as 26 killed, 230 wounded, and three missing for a total of 259. Oh, Others place losses as 256 for the Union, about 500 for the Confederates <clears throat> okay. well, it's in, the, in the area. Of the Confederate losses, approximately 180 were suffered by the 12th Georgia no. alone. Wow. Additionally, Confederate losses included Johnson, who had been shot in the ankle and severely wounded. Mm-hmm. So he's out of commission. Despite retreat from the field, some sources have argued that the Union forces achieved a draw by fighting Jackson to essentially uh, stand still. I don't think so. However. However. The defeat of the Union force at Milroy and Shanks' withdrawal from the Shenandoah Valley provided the Confederates with a strategic victory. Yeah. Old Stonewall would later summarize the battle in a single sentence. God blessed our arms with victory at McDowell yesterday. <laughs> Jackson continued his Valley campaign after McDowell. His next battle was against an outpost of Banks' army on the 23rd of May. And the Confederates then defeated Banks' main force on the 25th of May. Further victories at the battles of Key Cross? No. <laughs> Fucking stupid. Further victories at the battles of Cross Keys on the June 8th and Port Republic on the 9th of June. Restored Confederate control of the Shenandoah Valley. Good for them. Look uh, at those guys. Right. Civil War Trust and its partners have acquired and preserved 583 acres in the battlefield as of 2019. Good for them. The battlefield is in good state of preservation with some of the wartime buildings still standing. Hey. Trail leads to the site of some of the fighting on Sitlantine's Hill. Oh. And the site of the battle is commemorated with markers. Oh. Some of the soldiers. Crayolas? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> some of the soldiers killed during the battle are buried in a cemetery in McDowell. Oh. Uh-huh. Poor guys. Yeah, what are you going to do? Do they got names? I'm sure. No, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on. Battle of Drury's Bluff. It's her. Yeah, Drury's Bluff. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know the Confederates? <laughs> the monitor. <laughs> do I know the Confederates? <laughs> you know, the Fort Island. The Battle of Drury's Bluff, also known as the Battle of Fort Dallin, mm. or Fort Drury, right. took place on 15th May 1862 in Chesterfield County, Virginia. Chesterfield County. It's part of the Peninsula Campaign. Yeah. Four Union Navy warships, including Ironclad, USS Monitor, and Galena. And United States Revenue Cutter Services, Ironclad, USRC, and Nagatuck. Steamed up the James River to test the defenses of Richmond, Virginia. Well, they're like, what, uh, when you have a... <laughs> <laughs> we need we need to see the the, the defenses of Richmond. <laughs> How strong are they? Right. We're moving towards the map. I mean, it is the country's capital. It should be pretty pretty strong. All right. Better be. Spring of 1862, Union Major General George B. McClellan launched an amphibious operation against Richmond by landing troops at Fort Monroe and then marching northwest up the Virginia Peninsula. After the fall of Yorktown and the withdrawal of Joseph E. Johnston's army up the peninsula, only the Confederate Navy ironclad CSS Virginia prevented the Union occupation of the Lower James River and Norfolk. Dang. When the Confederate garrison at Norfolk was evacuated by Major General Benjamin Huger on May 10th, Commodore Josiah Tattenall III knew that he could not navigate Virginia through the shallow stretches of the James River towards Richmond, so she was scuttled on May 11th off Craney Island to prevent her capture. Bye-bye, U.S. or CSS Virginia. Right. Oh, wow. Useless. These ships are all useless. Right. This opens the James River at Hampton Roads to federal gunboats, as usually it does. It's like in the islands and... Jeez, yeah. old Pete. The only obstacle protecting Richmond from a river approach was Fort Darlin. On Drury's Bluff, overlooking a sharp bend seven mile down river from the city. <laughs> the Confederate defenders, including Marines, sailors, and soldiers, were supervised by Navy Commander Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> Excuse me, what day is it? Bad <laughs> humbug. December 25th. Oh. It's Christmas. <laughs> Here's a couple of shillings. Mm. Go get your turkey. Go get the turkey. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're supervised by Navy Commander Ebenezer Ferrand and by Army Captain Augustus H. Drury. Oh, hey. hey, the owner of the property that bore his very name. Oh, look at him. He's so we better fight, right? right? Son of a bitch. Uh, the Southside Heavy Artillery. That's what August Drury is part of, apparently. Right, the Southside Heavy Artillery. The eight cannons in the fort included, including field artillery pieces and five naval guns, some salvaged from Virginia, commanded the river for miles in both directions. Okay. <laughs> guns from CSS Patrick Henry, including an eight-inch smoothbore. We're just up river and sharpshooters gathered on the riverbank. <laughs> An underwater obstruction of sunken steamers, pilings, debris, and other vessels connected by chains was placed just below the bluff, making it difficult for vessels to maneuver in the narrow river. Well, that's terrible. All right. 5th of May, detachment of the U.S. Navy's... 15th. Yep, 15th of May, detachment of the U.S. Navy's North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Heard of these guys. Under the command of Commander John Rogers. Yeah. Steamed up the James River from Fort Monroe to test the Richmond defenses once again. The flotilla consisted of the ironclad gunboat USS Monitor, commanded by Lieutenant William N. Jeffers, and the Galena, the flagship, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the screw gunship, Aerostook, the side wheeler, Port Royal, and the twin screw semi submersible ironclad, dang, semi submersible, mm-hmm. which is the ironclad USRC Nagatuck. 7.45, doesn't say AM or PM. Well, it's 0, 0.745, so oh, it's so AM. It's AM. Galena closed to within 600 yards of the fort and anchored. But before Rogers could open fire, two Confederate rounds pierced the lightly armored vessel. Well, you can't do that. Yeah, pull that gain, pull that uh, anchor up and let it roll. All right, the battle lasted over three hours, and during that time, Galena remained almost stationary and took 45 hits. Mm. Her crew reported casualties of 14 dead or mortally wounded and 10 injured. Dang. Monitor was a frequent target, but her heavier armor withstood the blows. Right. Contrary to some reports, Monitor, despite her squat turret, did not have difficulty bringing her guns to bear and fired steadily against the fort. Fantastic. Nagatuck sustained little damage compared to the Monitor and Galena due to her semi-submersible design. Fantastic. Unfortunately, she had to withdraw when her 100-pounder parrot rifle exploded. Ooh. The two wooden gun bolts remained largely out of range of the big guns, but right. the captain of Port Royal was wounded by a sharpshooter. <laughs> Around 11 o'clock... The Union ships withdrew to City Point. Yeah, they're like, yeah, it's pretty heavily guarded, guys. Yeah, this is a fail. All right, we figure that out. Well, during the battle, Corporal John F. Mackey from the Union became the first Marine to enter. Nope. First Marine to earn the Medal of Honor. The Ram. Ram. The massive fort on Drury's Bluff had blunted the Union advance just seven miles short of the Confederate capital. At a loss of seven Confederates killed and eight wounded. Well, that's cool. Could have got more than that. All right. Richmond remained safe, however. Rogers reported to McLennan that it was feasible for the Navy to land troops as close as 10 miles away. Some amateur researchers think the Union Army never took advantage of this observation, yet the entire purpose of the expedition was to obtain such information. <laughs> I think they wanted to have that war go as long as they could. Probably. The Money, man. Mm-hmm. Ain't no different than today, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the area saw action again during the Siege of Petersburg, which the Army of the James landed on May 5th, 1864, almost exactly two years later, right. at Bermuda 100, a neck of land north of City Point at the confluence of the James and Appomattox River. Hey, bitch, just got that bitch right. <laughs> <laughs> Only 15 miles south of Richmond. Army was marched over land, advancing within three miles of Drury's Bluff by May 9th. From a tactical perspective, Bermuda 100... Bermuda 100 allowed a complete amphibious landing with less likelihood of a counterattack from landing a five miles closer to Drury's Bluff in Fort Darwin. Right. Cool. So, accomplish nothing. Right. Nothing happened. And nothing, not, much to do about nothing. And they didn't get no info on it, how well Richmond is defended. Right. Well, they do. Well, not really. They know they can't go by water. Well, they could if they actually drew up a plan, I bet. Well, they already established that they could have sent troops within a couple miles. Right, and it's invaded. Invited. But, as we've seen so many times in these episodes, Dude, the Union could know these guys aren't so smart. The Union could have took 250000 and hit Richmond like now and been over. Think so? Oh, I know so. Think so? Hmm. That's going to do it for us in the battles of McDowell, Elfin's Landing, and Drury's Bluff. A little short little episode here, but we got three battles in. And given that one battle where it was... 82nd different infantries and brigades uh, talking about it. We've got a lot of information here today. So uh, that's going to do it for us. We'll be back next week probably for at least the Battle of Princeton Courthouse, the Battle of Whitey, Whitney's Lane, the capture of Tucson. Oh. And 
maybe we'll even stick in a battle of Front Royal in Virginia. Um, yeah, that's it. We don't have another. Well, we have the first battle of Winchester coming up in a couple of weeks. Probably the next episode after this. Right. After next week's episode. Um, yeah. Got a lot going on. Still working up towards. Let's get it on. Still working up towards um, the year's biggest battle. Biggest. Second bowl run. Manassas. Manassas. Only fought for three days. Only. Yeah. Got a lot of stuff coming up for the Civil War. In the meantime, go check out our other podcast, Outlaws and Gunslingers, where this week's episode is all about um, the crime of the century. One of the many crimes of the century, Leopold and Loeb. You know what I love about those pictures? I don't know, but you're going to tell me in the middle of my uh, fucking plug, though. Those pictures are not fake. That's what battle look like, man. That's ridiculous. And you got the line-to-line battle behind them. Oh, my goodness. Some of the, these mother suckers were really like <laughs> two feet away, man. This is sad news. And the flag bearers are sitting there and waiting to get stabbed because they don't have no weapons. Man, this sounds terrible. Die for your country. Did you fight for your country though? Of course you did. It's considered fighting. If you're a bugler in the army, you're still we're in the army, weren't you? Let me. Or as you said the other day, a bugler, a be- <laughs> bag, be a bugler, bugler or whatever. Bugly. Um. Yeah. Um, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, Leopold and Loeb, two little privileged University of Chicago students were hell-bent on uh, committing the perfect crime, so they abduct a little 14-year-old, kill him, and as you might predict, it doesn't go the way as planned. No. Um, that's on Outlaws and Gunslingers. Go look up that podcast wherever you get your podcast, and then this week in sports history, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little baseball heavy this week, but... Um, I can tell you what, I already got the next two weeks put together, and holy shit, there's a lot, lots. We're going to have some football in there gonna be, shortly. Oh, yeah, oh yeah hockey, shortly football, hockey, basketball. basketball, that's all starting to come into play next week. So um, this week in sports history, is just look up Bang Dang Network, um, and you'll find this show, the This Week in Sports History, and a couple other shows that we do as well over there. And we'll be back for three or four battles next week where we are the Mouth of Michiganders. Bang, bang.